There are times when things just don't make sense. And sometimes it can feel like God isn't doing what makes sense to us. So what happens when disappointment can lead to a grudge with God? Hi, I'm Rob, and it's great to be able to catch up with you here today. Let me just highlight at the outset the interactive teaching videos that are available for kids through our church. They are exclusively on Facebook. And on the screen right now, you'll see the search that you would type in on Facebook to be able to land you in the place to be able to partake of those videos together as a family. You know, we have a tendency as people to carry painful parts of our past along with us wherever we go. Whether it's resentment against people who've hurt us, or mistakes that we've made, or even disappointment with God that eventually leads to bitterness, it all creates competition in our lives, fighting against the freedom God really has in mind for us. Now in these weeks, we've been exploring some of these grudges that we've carried, and sometimes they're against others, sometimes they're against ourselves, and today we're exploring when those grudges are against God. We know that pain, as we hold on to it, is going to keep us from genuinely stepping into the life God offers. But how do we begin to resolve this? Well, let's jump in together today. Recently, I encountered the story of a young woman named Jane and I found it to be tremendously encouraging, but at the same time, it was absolutely crushing to experience her story. Now, as a young woman in her 20s, Jane found out in a very short window of time that she had both life-threatening cancer and a husband who was preparing to abandon her. Now, moments of disappointment like this happen all the time in our lives. Loved ones get sick, they suffer, sometimes they even pass away prematurely. There's unfair treatment that happens in our lives and so many other things that cause us to wonder, God, why would you let this happen? A natural tendency sometimes can be to build a wall with God and even maybe a grudge against him. But as we look at this character today in Scripture, what we hope to find emerging is a path forward out of the grudge that sometimes accumulates in our lives. It may be challenging, it definitely will be difficult, but ultimately we'll discover together that it can be worth it. We're starting off to look at a few characters that we'll find in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 1. And we're introduced there to the man named Elkanah. And he has two wives. One is named Hannah and the other is named Penina. Now, Hannah could not conceive a child. And in her time and culture, this was considered a great shame, a source of disgrace for her personally. And so each year, Elkanah would take his family to a place called Shiloh, where they would involve themselves in the annual sacrifice and worship, and Penina would take this opportunity where people were celebrating to kind of twist the knife in on Hannah. We pick it up in verse 6 of chapter 1, when it says, So Penina would taunt Hannah and make fun of her because the Lord had kept her from having children. Year after year, it was the same. Penina would taunt Hannah as they went to the tabernacle, and each time Hannah would be reduced to tears and would not even eat. Now, from this description, we would kind of assume Hannah is definitely this sweet, lovely young lady, and Penina is the girl your mother warned you about. Now, in Hannah's mind, I'm sure that there were times when she asked some of those uncomfortable questions that all of us wrestle with in life. God, why would you bless Penina with children and not me? Like, does she really deserve it more than me? I mean, you could have given me a child, 
and you didn't. I'm a faithful wife. I'm a good person. I've prayed. I've believed. I've waited. And year after year after year, there's been nothing. Are you even listening? And it would be easy for Hannah to build up a grudge. Maybe you can relate. Hannah had to live with that situation that just will not go away. So what is often the case in a situation like this, someone often steps up and is well-meaning and looks to encourage. And Elkanah just happens to be the one in this story. And he's a good man. He loves his wife and he means well. And in this situation, he ends up asking what we would call a stupid question. Now, anyone who says there's no such thing as a stupid question has never been the guy who's asked his wife a question and got the look, did you really just ask me that question? Have you ever done that? I know I have, and Elkanah kind of does that here in verse 8 when he says, Why are you crying, Hannah? Elkanah would ask, Why aren't you eating? Why be downhearted just because you have no children? You have me. Isn't that better than having ten sons? Now I imagine Hannah kind of gave him that look like, did you really just ask me that? I mean, I know you meant well, Elkanah, but it really wasn't helpful. After all, Hannah is just trying to walk through life and please her husband, please the rest of the family, the one thing she wants, it seems like God is withholding. And her rival, Penina, is making her life miserable. And even her well-meaning husband is not really being all that helpful. At a time like that, when the situation seems to be completely out of your control, it's not what you want, it's not what you expected in life, it's not what you feel like you deserve, it's easy to get a little bit upset. Now, as a kid, I would hear kids in the schoolyard getting upset during our lunch breaks. And oftentimes, when there was some kind of conflict, it might culminate in a statement like, I'm not talking to you anymore. And somebody would turn and walk away. Now, when people let us down, we can sometimes find ourselves in that mode, right? And like those kids who actually said it, as adults, we kind of mature and become a little bit more suave. We don't say those words out loud, but we maybe say nothing. Maybe we just disappear and, and ghost the person that has somehow offended us. You know, we can walk through life, and there are times when things don't go the way we want them to. And we can find ourselves arguing and maybe even feeling like God isn't hearing us because he's not doing what we want. He's not doing what we expect. He's not doing what we think we deserve. And so he's letting us down and we can approach him with the reaction that says, God, I'm not talking to you anymore. Ultimately, this becomes one of those classic responses that we get upset with God, we might even call it the silent treatment, where we build a wall and we ghost him, and we end up carrying a grudge against God for what we think he's done or for what we think he hasn't done. And that grudge never gets us anywhere healthy. One author summed up a grudge like this, that a grudge is the heaviest thing that you can carry. Well, the other option is something we see in scripture and as we talk with people uh, who have walked this way and in some measure, I've even journeyed this way myself to some degree. And that is to start a moment of wrestling with God. One author called it a tunnel of chaos. It really is a process of working through the pain with God. And you know, there's a lot of good company in the scripture that went through one of those kind of processes or journeys. We see the physical wrestling that actually happens with Jacob 
in that one night where he wrestles all night. And then Jonah wrestles with God and argues with him about what he thinks ought to happen to the Ninevites and what God longs to happen for the Ninevites and God reasons with him in that process. David writes a lot of compelling words about feeling abandoned and about all his feelings and how he's frustrated with God as we read into the Psalms. Job expresses deep loss. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. So Hannah follows a long line of good company and engages with this wrestling. And in the process, we see a few things that are involved in all of our times of wrestling with disappointment and maybe even removing a grudge with God. It starts off in verse 9. It says, Once after a sacrificial meal in Shiloh, Hannah got up and went to pray. And Eli the priest was sitting at his customary place beside the entrance of the tabernacle. And Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. Those words really help us to see that Hannah is just absolutely unloading. She is pouring out her pain and her heart to the Lord. Now, the word that is often used in the Bible for what Hannah is doing is called lament. This describes on a very deep level a crying out to bemoan the situation, a groaning as we are expressing what is before us. And lament is often even portrayed as helpful or productive, a getting it all out, so to speak. And Hannah is expressing lament about her current situation. As we see, she's in deep anguish, crying bitterly. And then she even tells God, give me a son and I'll give him back to you. Now you could portray this maybe as bargaining, but I would suggest to you that this was actually an expression for Hannah of submission. What God was looking maybe for her to decide on her own. Hannah's son would be greatly used by God, and would Hannah have given her son to God so freely for his service if children had come easily? Or if she hadn't needed to come to this point of submission in her life. As you follow most people's journey of wrestling with disappointment with God, through their pain, there is often a moment of submission. And I would suggest to you that this is where we find Hannah's moment. She's praying, and Eli is watching her lips moving, and there's no sound, and he just suspects because of all of the festivities that there's something else going on. And so he tells her, you know, you need to get your drunk self out of here. Her reply is in verse 15. Oh, no, sir. She replied, I haven't been drinking wine or anything stronger, but I am very discouraged, and I was pouring out my heart to the Lord. Don't think I am a wicked woman, for I have been praying out of great anguish and sorrow. Well, the priest Eli blesses her and sends her on her way. Now, at this point, she has nothing. But there's a cheerfulness in her spirit that's different. She still has to deal with Penina. She still has Elkanah, who probably will fumble through trying to encourage her. And God still hasn't visibly answered her prayer. She's not pregnant yet with a child. But yet she locks on to faith and doesn't let go. And as she does, she finds herself in a waiting season. Although she wrestles with God here, we see it still takes more time for things to visibly change. Even so, Hannah locks on with God. And we see it in verse 19 where the entire family got up there early the next morning and went to worship the Lord once more. And as we read on, they go home. And there's no amount of time that's really given here. We see what happens next is that eventually she becomes 
pregnant. And she has the baby Samuel. Now it's very satisfying for us to be able to see the end of the story here. The author helps us connect all of the dots and we appreciate the rugged, challenging, even confrontational journey that Hannah had in the process of dealing with her disappointment and working through this enmity, this wall between her and God. However, when we're in the middle of our difficulty, it's harder to see how the dots are all connecting. Sometimes when we're walking through life, the dots seem many, and it's hard to see how they all fit in sequence. At the outset of our conversation, we mentioned the young lady, Jane. You may have met Jane recently, but she would have gone under the stage name of Nightbird on the current season of America's Got Talent. In the podcast extras, you'll find links to her blog and a recent viral video of her auditioning with an original song on the show, America's Got Talent. I'll let you discover her own brief journal story on your own. She works through the process of lament and of submission and of waiting, and you'll see those in her story as you watch and read about her life over the last few years. She's still on the journey of wrestling with God, and not all of the dots are connected for her, but the one brief entry that I've linked for you gives you an opportunity and a window of encouragement into her life to see her openness as she wrestles with some of the challenges that she is facing. Now, if you're in that situation today where you're wrestling maybe with disappointment, maybe it's even moved to the place where you're not talking to God right now, you're in grudge mode. Well, I have no cookie cutter answer to be able to help wrap up and bring conclusion to everything that you're facing. But if you choose to wrestle and deal with the disappointment, it will be a journey of rebuilding trust that will include lament and submission and waiting. Now, if to this point you've decided to give God the silent treatment, I trust you'll reconsider. And I want you to imagine how it could start to lighten your load if you allowed the grudge that you're carrying to fall away. Maybe it could begin like it did with Hannah, by pouring out your heart to God. Based on what we know already, like Hannah and Jane, you'll be in some very good company. Before we pray, let me take just a moment to remind you of the podcast extras. Now in the podcast extras today, there are, in addition to uh, resources for at-home worship and some journaling or conversational resources to put this scripture into practice, as well as links to our church and our kids' ministry, are the links that I mentioned related to Jane's blog, as well as uh, the video audition of her on America's Got Talent. I trust you'll take a few moments to engage there. You'll find the link to our website is in the description box of either YouTube or Facebook that will take you to our church website and allow you to engage with all of those resources. Additionally today, there are two prayers that I've included in the podcast extras. One of those we're going to pray in the next few minutes. It's written by a, a lady by the name of Jennifer Greenberg, and she really has taken the Psalms and expressed a lot of our heart in this process today. So let's pray. Oh Lord, my God, don't hide your face from me in my distress. Hear me when I call, answer me quickly. I feel so feeble and utterly crushed. I groan in the anguish of my heart. Let me hear joy and gladness again. Let the bones that have been crushed rejoice. Turn your ear to me, come quickly and rescue me. 
be my rock of refuge, a mighty fortress to save me. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, let me fear no evil. Let me feel you near me. May your shepherd's rod and staff comfort me, guide me, and keep me safe. For you are my hiding place. Protect me from trouble. Surround me with your song of deliverance. God, as we find ourselves in a variety of different places right now, whether it's from disappointment to anger to grudge, it can be hard to find words to express our pain. We might not even know where to begin. We fear that sometimes we'll say the wrong thing to you. But God, as we come to you today, we come humbly, we come honestly, and as we string together words that really express our lament, I pray that you would free us from some of the grudges that maybe we've been carrying against you as we deal with disappointment and as we deal with frustration in our lives when things haven't gone the way that we wanted or the way that we expected, even when we're struggling with what we feel like we should have deserved. And so God, today we thank you and we praise you for your goodness to us and for the fact that you keep circling around and walking with us even and especially in some of these very, very challenging and difficult times. In your name I pray. Amen. I want to thank you for taking a few minutes to spend this time together with us today. And if before you go, if you don't mind taking a moment just to like, comment, or share this video, that is always an encouragement to us. If you have any prayer requests you'd like to share, uh, feel free to use the email that's on the screen to share those with us. And we're praying for you, and we trust that you're praying for us too. I do want to again remind you of those podcast extras. I don't want you to miss out on Jane's story. And we'll look forward to seeing you again soon.